Hello, everyone. Is my mic on? OK. Can you hear me? Yeah. Fine. Uh, these are the wrong slides. Hang on. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Yogi Klatt. I'm a principal vehicle programmer at Cloud Imperium Games, and I focus on uh, space flight and, the, um, and space combat. I really love my job, so this is why I'm really excited to show you the progress that we did on Squadron 42 in the last two years. So there's two things I need to say here. First thing is, we're doing a live demo. And the build is about 12 hours old, so there is a good chance. <laughs> there is a good chance for, for bugs, which, um, well, if you see them, just, just look away. It, it will be fine. <laughs> Uh, the second thing is, um, I'm not flying myself today. It will be Brent Gunzinger. <laughs> He's using a setup of two VKB sticks, so left and right uh, HOSA setup from VKB. And he's also using the fantastic Toby device. So we'll swap during the presentation between using hat tracking and not using hat tracking. Um, yes. So, but the good thing is, the relationship between you and your starship, it doesn't start when you take off. It starts way before that. There's a lot of stuff we do now in pre-flight. Um, so please welcome back Ines Kaldas, who will walk us through that process. Is this working? Yes. OK. Hello, everyone. It's a privilege to be here back on stage to tell you all about the, what you can expect about the player interaction experience inside your cockpit. If you like, I've told you before how we've been working towards improving the player interaction experience all across our game. And we wanted to bring these improvements to what happens inside the cockpit. So we wanted to give you a greater immersion and. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, the slides are not. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, so you want to give you a greater immersion and have and give you a closer experience to what pilots go through in real life, not only when you're flying around your ship, but the moment you take your seat at the cockpit. So to achieve this, we've created, a, when you enter your ship, you'll be put in what do we call a new relax pose. So in this pose, you'll have free look enabled, so you can easily look around the cockpit and your dashboard. <laughs> the prompts will be showing over the button so you can easily find the ones you have to interact. And you, the pilot, have to press all the different buttons to get your ship ready for flying. And the character hands will be lowered away from the control stick. So all of this blends neatly into our new player animated interaction system, whereby any button is now physically pressed. So this new system uses what we call a CDIK approach. This stands for code-driven IK, or inverse kinematics, and gives full control of the IK setup to the code. So this, among other things, allows us to record the path of the hand relative to its target. So we can have more detailed animations than just simply blending the hand into position. So for example, we can open a flap and then press the button. But you know, enough of me talking. Let's go jump into the demo and see all of this in action. So now. So Brand very kindly will get us into the ship while you'll see the new enter sequence. And you'll see the new animations we have been working on. So you can see now that you won't directly grab the control stick. You'll be put on this, free, on this relaxed pose with free look enabled. And you can see the different prompts appear over the buttons. So let's get this show started and get your ship ready for flying. So Brent, if you could close the canopy so we don't go flying around with that open. Power our systems. Oh, look at that. Aegis combat assessment. And finally, turn our engines. Yeah, so we are, you are now ready for flying. So we will be, be bringing all of this to all of our ships in our fleet. And that's all from me. So please walk, join me in welcoming to the stage Tony to tell you all about the new UI.
Hi everyone, my name is Tony. I'm senior UI programmer here at CAG. And I'm here to explain some of the spoilers that you saw yesterday about our new Ship UI. So, are you ready to see the Ship UI in action? Yeah. <laughs> right. Bone, play the demo. The, I mean, Brand, continue with the demo. So, as you can see already, this ship has less intrusive UI, with more space to enjoy the stunning vistas that planets can offer, and less clutter views so you can focus during combat. This also means that the UI elements are now more relevant to the situation, linked to the operator mode. For example, when we change to scan mode, the crosshair has scanning information about your target, and even the MFDs have changed. Some of these elements can be customized, but we'll see more about that later. For this demo, we're showing the UI developed for this Gladius. Basic information related to navigation will always be available on your view, and this Gladius displays all of that with holograms around the dashboard. But other ships may have different layouts and styles, on brand with the manufacturer. For example, the Drake, that makes more affordable ships, rather than fancy and probably expensive holograms, may use physical screens, dials, and light indicators. This dashboard shows your current speed, the remaining afterburn, and some decoys available. On both far sides, we have status indicators that will show things like if your landing gear is on or any, any other flight systems. Worth mentioning that we have prototyped these for the demo, so right now they're holograms, but on the final design, these are going to be physical screens. On the far left, on the top of the dashboard, we have the indicator of which master mode and operator mode are you on. So let's change that to combat and talk about these new MFDs. So we have reworked all of these MFDs from scratch with brand new views using our UI technology building blocks. We can still navigate through these MFDs using the classic mouse interaction, holding F and then moving the mouse. On the left here, we can see the scanning view, which is going to show information that you obtain when you scan a target. It may show information about the ship name, the pilot name, or even the current operator mode of your target, so you know if they are just chilling around or they are ready to fight you. Cycling to the left one, we have the target status, which will focus on emissions, damage, and orientation of your target. We'll see that in action later. The next one, continuing to the left, will be the self status, which is contextual. So during navigation, that will show your current fuel. But during combat, like right now, will show information about your guns. You can click on the gun, and you can see basic information about that. You will see the name, and you can also see in which group they are assigned, which Yogi will explain later. On the MFT on the right side, we have the power management, where we can distribute the power of different systems of the ship. You can click on the triangle and move it around to change the distribution, and you can turn down the total power of the ship that will generate. The classic key bindings that you all know already works, so when you change the power management, you will see now a triangle on top of the radar to show you the changes. Now, instead of using mouse, you can also use key bindings to select MFDs and cycle through the views, which might be faster when you are in certain situations like during combat. And for those pro players out there, we have added about 100 key bindings, and I mean 100, to navigate through all of these systems. So you can fully customize how you want to navigate through them. And I really hope that's more than enough to use on your keyboard, on your HOTAS, or even on your game class setup. But if you need more, just let us know. Anyway, I think you're not going to need even those many shortcuts. For this operator mode, we now persistently save which views are shown on each MFD. So you can customize what's important to you for every situation. So as an example, during combat, you might want to have target information on your MFDs. But maybe when you change to quantum travel, have your current fuel, spend some time on the configuration screen, for example. Let's talk about this configuration screen. We're going to have now here a variety of options, from customizing UI elements to enable systems of the ship. We may see some of these later in action with Yogi. These settings are now available on this screen, not in the global settings of the game, for quick access. 
So it's just a warning, expect changes on the settings that you already know, but we'll tell you all about it when we have it ready. And the important bit about this is that they will persist to your ship. So you can keep different setup of which UI elements and even ship systems enable for how you personally use each of your ships. Now, some of you might be thinking that these Gladius settings have enough MFDs. Can we enable the top setting? For those of you that you want to see even more information, you can now cast versions of these MFDs to your helmet. For this, you're going to need to equip the appropriate helmet so it's connected to your ship and get, I can get all this information. You can use the key bindings, as I mentioned before, so you can select which cast do you want to control and how to cycle through them. So you can pin views that are important to you with, with your, that will move with your camera. So as you have seen, if you're aiming at the target or if you're moving with your head tracker, those views are going to be always with you. With all these tools, you can customize your experience and have it ready for every situation that you encounter with your ship, always displaying the relevant information to you. So for example, during combat, you may want to have all the UI elements enabled, all the pips, all the crosshairs, so the information of your ship on the physical MFDs, and maybe focus on the target information on your cast, so they're always on your view. But maybe when you go to quantum travel, you can turn those casts off so you can enjoy the vistas. That's all for me. Now we have MFDs ready, and let me bring Yogi back to tell you all about flying your ship. Thank you very much. OK, at this point, our ship is fully, fully powered up, ready to fly. Pre-flight is complete. So Brent, please uh, take off, put the landing gear in, and bring us out. Have you seen the interaction? This is great, isn't it? OK, so um, one of the problems we always have in uh, space games is to produce a sense of speed. Space is, is big. And the sense of speed is always produced by you know, small things going around you. So although it's not very visible here, the VFX team has actually added space dust. So in the future, you can tell where a ship is going, even, by out, uh, even without looking at instruments. Another thing we're focusing on as well is uh, G-force reactions. Uh, so Brent, if you could jump, come to a stop for a second. When your ship is sitting like that, and you strafe left and right, you have these small head motions uh, that basically make your head and your body react to the G-forces they're currently enduring. We're actually increasing them now. We also added rotational G-forces into the mix. So if Brent is now rotating the ship to the left, you also can see that your head is swaying a little bit. Things get a little bit more interesting um, when Brent is actually taking boost into the mix. So we um, now boost forwards. We now added a camera shake. We added uh, FOV changes. Um, and this all then plays together with the other things like you know the other exhaustion effects that we have. So overall, the ship should now feel a little bit more reactive than before. The same thing, sorry. <laughs> At the same time, we reduce the um, extensions that your uh, that look ahead code is, does, uh, is doing. So um, we basically narrowed it down a little bit, so it mixes better with GeForce reactions. So that even when you don't have a head tracker or something like that, it will still feel uh, pretty good. But this is just a minor change. Um, we also improve the flight controls themselves. So take a look at the speed gauge, for example. It's a little bit uh, <laughs> twitchy today. What that speed gauge is telling you, the number that's currently moving, is what kind of speed goal Brent is actually putting in. If he puts his stick all the way forward, the left one, you will now be able to see and read the number that you're asking IFCS to speed and forward uh, momentum. This also allows us to bring back the uh, sticky throttle we had uh, pre-3.5, where you now, if you play with mouse and keyboard, you can press W and S to increase and decrease your speed and let go of the key, and the ship will not automatically come to a stop. Of course, this is all completely configurable, so you can enable that or not if you want. Oh. <laughs> 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 
Okay, Brian, give me some hard flying now, like uh, blackout and all that. <laughs> okay, so um, another thing we changed in the flight model is that we actually looked at the tricoiling exploits. These are really important for PvP and racing uh, players among you, because tricoiling gives us a mathematical problem that we're trying to resolve. On some ships, when you tricord, you get actually up to 50% more acceleration. That huge difference uh, actually makes a lot of the ship difference meaningless. So we're cutting back on those. So um, the first implementation of that is already available in the master mode testing areas in 3.21, I think. Um, but we're improving the um, algorithm right now so that it actually is, let, uh, is less punishing um, in future master mode builds. Uh, this is actually a, a current version. So as long as you go roughly forward, you get the full Gs um, from, your, from, your back, from your back engines. OK, so now the biggie in the room. We're talking master modes. Master modes is by far the biggest change we're doing on the ship gameplay. In general, all of your ships will be put into or will get a master mode setup. And the master mode is affecting basically everything surrounding uh, everything on the ship. The ship itself, the, the, the flight model a little bit, but specifically the items and what they do. Um, and there are two master modes we're going to talk today about. One is SCM, which stands for Space Combat Maneuvering, and the other one is Navigation. So let's look into uh, SCM. SEM is the mode that Brent currently has um, has active. So you see the um, Brent. Can you go into the uh, indication, please, for the master mode? Just point with the mouse there, if you can. Yeah. So this is your current master mode. It says SEM. When you're you use SEM for basically all the gameplay that is not traversal, so a combat, mining, salvaging, you're using it for that. You have full access to your combat system. Your shields are working, <laughs> your thruster boost is fully active, your weapons are working. It's the high performance, high alertness mode that you're in. However, we will heavily restrict how fast we can go, um, we, we can go with your ship. OK, Brent, go to um, full max speed. So this Gladius on max speed and SEM can reach about 225 meters per second. That might seem slow compared to what you have in the pew right now, but it's still pretty fast. However, you can extend that speed. Um, Brent, if you just go forward and boost, so the Gladius can extend up to 500 me 550 meters per second. On this slide here, you can see the speed, gate, uh, the speed spaces we're talking about. So if you're just walk, uh, flying around in SEM, which is like the max speed of your, of your ship, you can reach the 225 meters per second. If you boost, you can reach up to 500 or 550. However, that boost space is not spheric. That means if you boost forward, you reach higher speeds than if you boost backwards. That is really important for space combat maneuvering because, or for dogfighting in general, because it discourages backstrafing. It actively actually punishes backstrafing, and it creates more interesting combat maneuvers. Um, the PvP players among you, they basically call this uh, encouragement to closing the gap, which is basically more forward-centric combat, which is much much more exciting than backstrafing and just trying to get some shots on. It also forces you as combat players to, uh, to commit to the decisions you did earlier in the fight. So it's going to be, uh, we think it's much more exciting. <laughs> okay. So in short, you pick SCM when you need to fight, when you want to fight, or when you need to fight, right? Um, the thing with the master mode switches is that they do not happen instantly. They take a while to move over. So um, we're now going to put our ship into uh, the second mode, which is navigation. So navigation mode is basically the opposite of SCM. What uh, this does, it gives you a high speed, low performance mode. Your shields, they will collapse. Your weapons will not be able to fire. Your defensive systems will, will not be functional. Um, but you have higher speeds. So in nav mode, you can still speed, uh, reach the speeds of uh, what you have currently in the PU, something, I mean, depending on the ship, sometimes 1,000 meters or 1,400 meters per second. Um, but all your regenerative systems, so regenerating uh, the weapon capacitor, your thruster boost, will be inhibited. So this means when you want to go fast, you need to be very, very careful when you want to swap over. So imagine you're in a fight and you want to escape. You should not do it right away, because if you just swap to navigation mode in the hope to flee, you are being left with no shields. And the first thing that will go offline when you are hitting with distortion guns is the quantum drive. And that is important, because the quantum drive will spool automatically up when you enter nav mode, 
and it will then unlock the higher speeds. So this means when you're in NAV mode and you're fighting, you're very vulnerable, so you should get out as fast as possible. Luckily, <laughs> navigation mode not only allows you a higher speed, but also uh, gives you access to the new quantum travel experience, which we're going to show in a, in a minute. So that is enough point that you see there on screen. This is the uh, point where I want to go to in quantum travel to. Before we do that, I need to quickly explain what this is about. So currently in the PU, when you quantum travel from A to B, you're actually not, not really moving. You're going on a spline, and you're teleported in every frame along that spline. So there's basically no, no meaningful gameplay we can add there. The new quantum travel experience is fully physicalized. Physics is always on, which means when you quantum travel from A to B, you're actually accelerating using our awesome physics engine. And because it's physicalized, it, give us, it gives us a lot more meaningful gameplay we can, we can play with. So Brent will start the quantum travel in a second. What will happen then is your quantum drive will initiate the jump. You will see an effect that distorts the space around you. And you will accelerate forward. During the acceleration process, and this, so this is the time until you actually re reach your cruise speed, the ship will experience forces. And you as a player, you're responsible to counter these forces. So there is an element of failure. OK, Brent, um, let's show that. And take your hands off. So what you just saw is basically the failed attempt to quantum travel. Brad wasn't countering the forces, therefore he was thrown out, the, the quantum bubble collapsed and threw you out. Your ship doesn't like that. IFCS needs five, six seconds to recover from that, during which time you, uh, you're, just, you're just tumbling, right? So, um, so, and this is not just uh, like dependent on your, on your skills. If you think selecting a proper quantum drive doesn't matter in the future, <laughs> Think again. You want to take care of your quantum drive. You want to repair it and keep it in good shape. So if you buy a cheap one, your travel will not necessarily be faster, but it might be harder. OK, so Brent, show us how it's done properly. You can now go hands off. Okay, so there's a second variant of quantum travel, and this is for short range jumps. Sometimes you jump somewhere or you go somewhere, and you, and you see the next point of interest is like 1200 kilometers away. We're not going to force you anymore to travel that by hand. You will use a technique called quantum boosting. It's a quantum-based short-range jump for like something between a couple of hundred kilometers to like 30,000 kilometers or so. When you use quantum boosting, the process is practically the same, but the quantum bubble will not stabilize itself, so you need to be hands-on for, for the whole time, and the speeds are naturally, well, slower. But it's not slow, it's still quantum traveling, right? OK, so Brent, can you boost to, uh... oh, reinforcement needed. Yeah, let's go there. Let's boost. Oh, actually, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK, so what Brent is currently um, <laughs> showing here is, I think I forgot to mention, quantum boosting works in every direction. You don't need nav points. <laughs> Brent is awesome, thank you. OK, so now, please boost to reinforcements needed. So if there's enough point and you boost, your quantum travel system will 
pick that knife point to go to. Welcome to Pyro 3. As you can see, there's a lot of UI happening right now. There's a lot of context there. And this is not an online demo, it's a single player. So that means all these units there, <laughs> they're friendly and hostile, so they're probably fighting with each other. Which is a good segue to talk about AI improvements. And there's one man who can tell you, tell you all about AI. This is the man with the nicest legs at CIG. Well, please welcome Diego Marti Mason. So who's excited to see the new AI changes? Yeah. Hi, everyone. As Yogi said, my name is Diego Marti Mason, and I am the AI programmer focusing on the fly combat. Over the past year, we've been working on delivering a thrilling experience to the AI encounters. Let me first walk you through our journey. We first started looking at the current AI behavior in the PU we quickly realized how uniform fighting was and how we were not using all of the tech available to us to make a more interesting experience. We had the foundations, and we wanted to learn more about how you, the players, do your combat encounters in the verse. So we did this by getting combat recordings, analyzing videos, and internal playtesting, where we were hammering each other for hours. It was fun, unless you went up against experienced fighters like they are. Anyway, with all of these data, we started crafting the first prototype with the focus of bringing that human behavior into the AI brain. When the first version was ready to be tested, I handed it out to one of the best internal pilots in the team, Yogi. So Yogi, what do you think about my first prototype? It was an exercise of humility. <laughs> it was an exercise of humiliation. <laughs> I hated it, and I blame Diego. <laughs> <laughs> so this was due to the AI being able to keep a good range control and a perfect orbit around their target while maintaining a constant firing solution. Come on, it's a computer. We learned a lot from our initial prototype, and it really helped us to define what we wanted to deliver. A combat experience where the AI yet challenging makes mistakes, just like us humans. We want players to leave every combat encounter with a feel of satisfaction by encouraging you to keep on the move and make use of the vehicle systems available to you so you can at least try to win the fight. Let's see how we brought this new iteration of combat to life. We broke down in multiple stages. The first one, interception. Then the main engage phase, which we broke in different tactics, strafer, Jouster, Chaser, and finally, Disengage. Let's switch to the demo. As you can see, Brent has encountered a skirmish. Let's talk more about the combat flow there. OK, we will start with Interception. After acquiring the target, the primary aim is to close the gap with the target. If the AI is already near the target, the interception phase is skipped completely. If it's too far, it will tell the AI to use the new master mode to swap into navigation mode and make use of the full speed to chase. Swapping back to SCM mode when we are in a striking distance. That leads us to our second phase, engage. Here the AI selects an adequate tactic based on combat environment. These are choosing via the traits and tactic selector system. You've heard more about them in the previous talk by Francesco. So let's talk about the strafer. As this is a six degrees of freedom game, it's the natural combat shape adopted by pilots. We have to relate to the same behavior to our AI, ensuring also that orbits are close and adding variations to include rolling. Strafers will break combat if they cannot keep an orbit. So now we see how the hammerhead is being attacked by hornets. These hornets are jousters. Jousters consist of performing straight-in attacks whilst outputting a lot of firepower, blowing through, smooth turning, and repeating. We added variations for the more skilled pilots, like a skid roll attacks that provide a spider-like fly path. Jousters are also good at monitoring for back strafers, so if they cannot get into strike distance, they will just break. And finally, the chaser. 
Now, Brain is going to get there in a second, but the chaser is going to be the Cutlass, which is following one of the Hornets and is allied with the uh, Hammerhead. Now, we are really far, far away, 10 kilometers. So the chaser, it will try to always stay on the target six. The idea is to force the target into a defensive stance by making them turn into the chaser. This maneuver will be seen mainly in squads and atmosphere combat. The final phase, which can happen at any time, depending on the combat situation, is disengage. This phase is triggered based on constantly listening to multiple events in parallel. To name a few, critical health, damage to shields, or weapons depleted. There is also a shorter version of disengage that we call pace breaks, which occurs during long periods of combat due to fatigue, nature of the combat encounters. These pace breaks are short, and the main objective is to perform a simple maneuver to gain a new advantage position and strike again. This new flow is what encompasses the core of our new AI fly combat experience in combination with AI traits that will give designers the tools to tailor each combat encounter in the verse. Like, for example, they can choose the ace traits that will allow AI pilots to make use of all of the ship's angular velocity so they can keep a more precise orbit. So for some of you out there, it's going to be a good challenge. While we've been, while we've, we've been mainly focusing on fighter behavior, we've also started to follow the same process to other ship types, like gunships and capitals. In the near future, we want to deliver an experience where going against a capital ship like an Idris is a tough fight, that unless you bring the right combinations of tools, meaning ships that are equipped to take down capital ships, you will get demolished by their powerful turrets. Now, after all of the feedback, in our first internal playtest, we received a lot of constructive and positive feedback. And Yogi is not longer being destroyed by the AI, so I think he likes it a bit more. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoy the new AI. And back to you, Yogi. Thank you, Diego. OK, so now we're going to talk about, uh, we heard about how AI makes my life hard. Now let's talk about how to return the favor. We're talking weapons. So the weapon and aiming systems and squadrons, they went through a lot of changes. I can only mention a couple of them, so I will go through them relatively quickly. First thing on our to-do list is basically weapon tuning. At the moment, almost all weapons in the PU are practically the same. In squadron, that's not the case. Almost all weapons have different properties. Uh, they're being, they have like different projectile velocities, different DPS numbers. But they're not just um, different in terms of these numbers. They also, they also feel different. Remember the Cinch cannons from like a couple of years ago? They were, <laughs> they were very powerful weapons, but they were extremely easy to use, which, which made them meta weapons. So we're going to bring the Cinch cannon back, but we make sure that the amount of work you put into these cannons in order to employ them is on par with the other guns. So there's a lot of stuff that we're going to do um, to make sure that we like weapons have very a lot of pros and cons um, and avoid uh, meta. Specifically for this build, Brent is equipped with a nose, uh, I think a close and a laser repeater. Can you fire it once? Yeah. And the other weapon he has is a uh, he has um, two weapons on the wings, which are um, Gats ballistics. Uh, sorry, Gats Gats cannons, uh, size three, with one push. They're actually firing two, so we're also going to have uh, burst weapons um, and so on. OK, cool. So a problem we have in space games is controlling the engagement ranges, because we want to bring the fights close. But the problem is that, well, <laughs> how do I put this? Um, Weapons, usually, uh, in order to bring them close, what the game, the game does usually do is they just restrict the ranges. Like in the PU, uh, a lot of the weapons have exactly a range of 1,400 kilometers, which means often the fights occur at 1,399 meters. Um, this, is not for, this is not a good um, way for us to control the weapons. Um, and we, just, we tried out things like damage fall off, so that uh, bullets get more damaging the closer you are. But the problem there is how do you communicate that to the player? So we're going to do a couple of different things with that in the future. Let's see when the graph comes on. OK, so show of hands or show, which of you has an Ares? OK, as an Ares pilot, you might uh, know the following problem. You have a target. You're going to aim at it. Um, 
And then you, um, this is, what the? Okay, <laughs> I need to go back. Okay, there's actually some stuff not, not there anymore, I don't know. What happens when you aim with your crosshair on the, over the pip um, is that you actually not aiming at the pip. The legacy system gives you a pip which does not show you where the pip, where the weapon needs the pip. The new aiming system actually produces the pips based on where the weapon sees them and reprojects them on the target. That means the aiming information you're getting is actually much, much more precise. And uh, this is a very interesting, um, Sorry, I said the completely wrong thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Okay. Controlling weapon ranges, sorry. I'll do it now, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. Controlling ranges. In the future, all the weapons will get much, much longer ranges. Size 1 weapons will fly to up to 5 or 6 kilometers before the despawn. The way how we do this, wait. The way how we do this is we're adding spread. Because spread is for us is a very good indication on how to control the ranges. This is not a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship there, so don't worry. You won't get like spread with like 20 degrees uh, offset or something like that. Don't worry, right? But if we compare the spread of the, uh, spread of the weapon with the target size, we know when the weapon is in range. We know when, the f uh, when you actually are close enough so that the majority of your hits can hit. And we're telling that, we're telling you that via the um, via the aiming system now. So, Brent, let's go back to the demo. If you get a green pip and a green crosshair, it means you have a high chance of your weapons hitting hitting the target. If Brent takes a little bit of a step back and waits until the pips and the crosshair turn red, this does not mean that the ship is out of range. You can still hit it, but you might waste bullets. Um, this also has the benefit that, I'm not sure if you saw that before, but if you look at how many, how many bullets are in the air, you're actually getting a lot of bullets, uh, uh, a lot more bullets, and it just looks a lot better. Okay, Brent, just, just kill these guys now. Bam! Oh, well. <laughs> okay, so. Um, that was the, this one. Okay, a thing you might have seen is that um, Brent has, is loaded with size 3 guns on size 3 gimbals. That means we're removing the M-1 system. That <laughs> <laughs> the reason for that is the original intention of like, controlling the performance between joystick and mouse players just didn't work out, and the new aiming system is flexible enough to deal with these differences. So we're just removing it and keep going. So, next point, pip grouping. If you have different weapons of different, with different projectile velocities, you will get different pips. Because merging the pips makes no sense for us anymore, because the weapons are going to have vastly different projectile speeds. So if Brent, for example, enables all the weapons now, you get separate pips. So let's talk a bit about pip optimizations here. And this is the thing I messed up before. Again, who is an Aries? <laughs> if you aim at your target, you get a pip, right? Your Aries owners know that. You aim at the pip, you shoot, you miss. And this is because the pip is not being shown where you need it. In the future, we're actually offsetting the pip where the weapon sees it and then reproject this onto the crosshair. Like that. And when you then hit, you hit. No, when you then shoot, you hit. Um, and this is, of course, also communicated by the aiming system. So when the, when the pips turn green and when the, weapon, uh, when the crosshair turns green, just shoot. OK, so now to the actual best part. We cannot take down this hammerhead. It's too big for us. We need to, but we can cripple it. The weak points on the hammerhead are the turrets. The way we're going to do this in the future is with precision targeting mode. Brent? Enable precision targeting mode? There we go. <laughs> what this does, it does three things. You get this full zoom on the target. Um, you get a lower RPM of your weapons, which increases or decreases the spreads for more precision. And you get the painting mechanic. Anywhere where you put your crosshair on that, on that ship, 
it will tell the gimbal system where to aim at. So if Rent now attacks the turrets, your aiming system will automatically lead the shots. Bam! One turret down. Okay, so this hammerhead now understood that it's not good. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't have, uh, stand a chance right now. But this will be the way how you in the future will, will uh, fight um, against sub-targets and so on. The good thing about this, it also works even without um, painting the target directly. So you can do very, very precise warning shots. Um, and, and there's no aim assist that kind of like destroys your aiming processes. Okay, so the fight is now over. Sorry, I need to rush this a little bit because I messed up stuff before. And you're going to look at Pyro 3. Okay, Brent, switch to nav mode and bring us down to that landing spot. So Pyro 3 is also called Bloom. It's a very big planet with a nice atmosphere. And, um, oh, something wrong with throttle. <laughs> Oh well, something's wrong, wrong with the throttle. We'll try to go down as fast as possible, though. <laughs> I said gameplay demo might have bugs. <laughs> okay. Let me go there now. Okay. Yeah, steeper angle, that works. <sighs> okay, so the, um, the thrusters on your ship, they do, not like the, uh, they do like the vacuum of space. They're... Well, we're talking spaceships here, right? And we have thruster efficiency curves on these thrusters. So at some point, especially the MEV thrusters, they will cease working because they don't like atmosphere. They will overheat very, very quickly. So there's the question, what happens when you go down to a planet and you want to rotate your ship with your thrusters off? Well, we'll see. Can you go to external view? Can you waggle your tail? Okay, back first person. Okay, so what you see here is the new aerodynamics model. Because obviously our uh, left stick is somewhat damaged or so, uh, <laughs> we can't be as fast as we want. Um, actually, Brent, can you try a W and S on the keyboard instead? Oh, it doesn't work. Oh. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Yep, okay. No, the stick is, uh, is, the stick is, uh, affecting us. Okay, anyways, we're going to go down as much as, uh, as far as possible. So the new aerodynamic system is a complete replacement of the aerodynamic system that you currently have. And you need, thr um, you need your control surfaces to actually uh, turn the ship around. It simulates the airflow over your lift surfaces, and therefore the slower you become, the less effective those uh, control surfaces will be in order to turn your ship. So we can demonstrate this. So if Brent just sits here and yaws left and right, you will see he cannot go f uh, further than that. That is in line with what real airplanes uh, also experience when they're trying to use the rudder to yaw left, uh, left, uh, left and right. So what Brand can do here is he can roll and he can pull to actually change um, his direction. Okay, so just for this demo, we added a button. The button is called Thruster Disconnect. Because um, at the moment in the PU, when you go through a planet, you're using the thrusters to rotate. We're not doing that anymore. So Brent, disconnect the thrusters, please, and put the ship into a purposeful stall. A stall happens when the airflow over a wing ceases, um, or over a lift surface ceases. And then at some point, you will not have any authority anymore, and your ship will not turn and so on, and you will basically fall out of the sky. That is naturally a state that every plane wants to avoid naturally, right? And this is happening right here. Brent is not able to, uh, to use the control surfaces right now because the ship is in a, in, in a process of stalling. However, the airflow will pull the nose back into the wind, and once you have enough speed, he can actually, well, he, he gets authority back over these control surfaces. That means for you as players, what you, could, what you can actually do, you can do aero braking, you can do pure gliding if you want to. Uh, you can even do like competitions like, I don't know, like drop ships out of orbit and then see how fast far they glide. This is all possible with a new system. So let's talk about the problem 
how do you come to a stop now? <laughs> to come to a stop with the new system, you need to purposefully put the ship into a stall. But don't worry, when we don't have the thrusters disconnected, IFCS will help you. So you're going to bring down the speed more and more until you're reaching stall speed, which is about now. And then the thrusters will kick in and, and catch you. That means, however, you are now in a state that the thrusters don't, don't like, right? So at the moment, we have turned this up, but in the future, you will not be able to hold this for long. So if Brent, for example, now from a hover, strafe is left, more left, more left, more left. The wind flow again pulls the ship over, and you go forward again. Okay, so now, Brent, now show us uh, how to come to a uh, hover. And uh, do we have some water here? Oh, yeah, there's our point. Okay. Highway to. <laughs> okay, so there's our landing point. can become a little bit slower, I don't know, 100 meters per second. So we're trying to land somewhere here. Whoa, look at this. <laughs> yeah, that water is great, like, awesome. OK, so now we're coming to a... Uh, so now Brent will try to uh, land with a broken throttle. <laughs> and yeah, he's aided a little bit here by, uh, by the landing gear. So he has landing gear out, I think, because that uh, automatically enables precision mode at the moment so that you're a little bit slower. But you can, of course, like, turn this off as a player. And then you come smoothly down to a landing. The best way to land your ship is in decoupled, because you can just like very smoothly land it on the surface. And clunk. And now you're going to power down the ship using the new interactions. Engines off first. Then we're in the relaxed pose again, as Ines showed before. Power off. And the canopy off. Uh, no, open, not off. Don't, don't put the canopy off. <laughs> and get out of the ship. And uh, probably go for a swim or something. OK, that was a bit of a buggy, bumpy ride. But um, thank you for taking um, the time with us. And we'll see you in the verse. Thank you. <laughs>